sisters do we have out here? Spanish speaking brothers and sisters, we learned this song just for you so you can praise the Lord with us in your own tongue. And our Haitian and French speaking members and friends, we learned this song just for you so you can praise the Lord in your own song with us. So join in, Te Alabamos, Gloria, Alleluia. Te alabamos, te alabamos, te alabamos, gloria, aleluya, te alabamos, te alabamos, te alabamos, gloria, aleluya. Now to our French speaking brothers and sisters. have been blessed over the last few weeks. The Lord has been using his servants in bringing the word of God in a very strong way. Just a few weeks ago, we had our dear elder, Elder Muldrow, stand before and deliver the word. Amen. We had also a sister from our church, uh, Sister Christina, uh, Sanford that uh, stood and delivered the word as well, Amen. representing. Uh, we had a former pastor um, that came in for a convocation weekend, and uh, he dropped the word, uh, Pastor Goodlow, Amen. and he brought a, the good news to us, Amen. encouraging us to get involved, each and every one of us getting involved taking the message out. Last week, I wasn't here. I was in um, Reno preaching there, but I heard that we had uh, the three uh, preachers. I was almost saying the three musketeers, but you know, <laughs> the three preachers standing, uh, Elder Brown, Elder Muldrow, and Brother Burris standing and delivering a word of truth. And uh, you know that it's good news when, um, well, it's not always good news, but when you get some text messages and said, Pastor, we were blessed. Yeah. And uh, I was so happy to hear that. Uh, next week, we have a, a, a preacher that is uh, gearing up to fly into Vegas. He is um, Pastor Marvin Clark. And uh, he is um, a preacher that is coming in, and uh, he could be our youth speaker. He could be our youth pastor. And so as he comes in, I want you to pray for him. Um, pray for, first of all, safe travels. And I want you to be here to hear him. And uh, we will give you more information on him next week. And so next week, um, it's our prayer that uh, as he delivers the word, uh, the word will touch down in such a special way that it will be a blessing to us. And hopefully we could see his ministry here in this church. So pray for the process. Um, we're hoping to have our youth pastor installed here 
um, before November. Amen. Before Amen. November. Amen. That is high hopes, but I, we have to hope high. Amen? Amen. Uh, today we have a, a preacher that has been tasked to deliver the word uh, for us. Uh, he is uh, a trained a trained um, physician. Um, the Lord has used him in many capacities. Um, one of the things I could tell you that he is a husband. Amen. And he is married to the wife that is about, that is about to stand. <laughs> All right, there it is, amen. And, and, and the wife that is still standing. Okay, very good. And he has two children, uh, one that prayed in the uh, children's story, uh, Jalen, and she is standing. Is she? Is she standing? Oh, yeah, there she is. Uh, amen. All right. And also, uh, there is a little child, too. His name is Carson. I don't know if he's sleeping, right? Well, you could lift his hand up for us so that we could see that. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And uh, family first. That's what we believe, right? Amen. And we praise the Lord for um, his family. Now, um, Elder Johnson, he is an ordained elder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He is a preacher. Uh, he is a singer. He is an artist. He is a graphics artist. Amen. Uh, he is a producer. Amen. He is an engineer. Uh, but more than anything else, I have known him from the very first time I came here. I know him to be a man of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I believe that he has a word uh, for us today. And his word is not his own words, but it is a word from God. And I pray as you uh, hear him today uh, that you will just allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you, that the words that comes out of his mouth will convict us and bring us closer to Yeshua, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So after uh, our beloved choir sings, the next voice you will hear is that of Elder Ryan Johnson.
God restores. Like they're singing the story of my life. Oh, I have so many things I'd like to say here, but our time is short. And the Lord has seen fit that we turn in our Bibles like we did back in the day. My mentor, Pastor Mendenhall, always told me, boy, don't be dependent on them PowerPoints. You better have it in the Word. And that's what we're going to do this morning. I would like to thank the pastor for that extremely, extremely generous introduction. Man made me sound a whole lot better looking than I really am. I had asked him, please don't introduce me. Can't I just get up and preach? But he said he had a higher authority that told him, you got to do an introduction. I got an idea who that was. I got one of them in my house. <laughs> Speaking of which, though the pastor recognized her, I like to take my time, if I may, and recognize my beautiful and faithful wife. Many of you know this, many of you do not. I am a type 1 diabetic, the kind you're born with, so I got my juice and I got my water. And particularly of late, as my wife and I have embraced this new preacher thing that God has called us into. The devil has wreaked havoc on my health. Tried to take me out. And undoubtedly gonna try again, but the other night, when it was a particularly bad night, I fell into a fitful sleep. And sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up because the, the, the lamp by the, by the bed was on. Gentlemen, may I have just a little more volume on the microphone, please? Thank you. The, the bedside lamp was on, and, and, and I had my back to the lamp, and, and I opened my eyes, and I just kind of turned this way, and I saw Anissa sitting cross-legged on the bed. See, I was laying down. She was up right about here, right about shoulder height, and she had her hands like this. And her head was bowed. Now, there are men who want power. There are men who dream of fancy cars. <laughs> but I say, blessed is he <laughs> who got a woman who knows how to pray for her man in the midnight hour. And I just turned back around and went to sleep. I didn't want her to see me. I didn't want her to know that I had noticed her, but just the sight of my wife praying for me went down in my bones and it did more healing. Oh, let me calm down. We got a ways to go. While I have your attention, before I put you to sleep later on, right? I would like to emphasize that this evening, this evening at 5 o'clock, we will have an emphasis on mental health awareness. We will hear from Dr. Barbara Hunley. From a sister by the name of Oria, did I say that right? McGarry. We'll hear from Sister Madden and we'll hear some other things. She said that it was imperative that you know this is not just for women. There's some men out there that need some awareness of mental health. Come on back and learn something this evening. Also, tomorrow, the transportation, I am told, will leave at 9. If you show up at 9, you will be left. We are all going over to fellowship and to exercise and stretch our muscles and fill our lungs over at that beautiful park by Craig. I think it's called Craig Park. Is that what you call it? Craig, Craig Ranch Park. Okay. Hope you brought your word with you. We're going to be turning today. 
In the interest of time, I will read a lot, and then some things I will ask us to read together. This is important because there are some things that I really want us to see in Scripture. I'm going to read from the book of Revelation. And may I have a B-flat, please? Thank you. The 18th chapter in the book of Revelation and verse 1, and it says, And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he, the angel, cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon is fallen. Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Verse 4, and I heard another voice from heaven. And this is it right here. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Come out of her, my people. Who's her? He's talking about Babylon. Who's my people? God's people. That's us. The prophet John would imply that God's people are in Babylon. Now, this is not the literal Babylon. This is a spiritual Babylon. John, known as the Revelator, was shown signs of the end. He was shown the things of today. He saw F-16s and F-22s, and, and he saw atomic bombs. And it was such an important message that God had for his people that he sent mighty angels in the form of vision to talk to John. And he said to John, write. And John wrote what he saw. And this angel says, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her plagues. I do not wish to alienate anyone. We know that today is Health Awareness Day. We are going to be discussing a thing called the health message. Now, if you are a visitor and you are not familiar with the health message, I would just like to make a statement so that you can understand what we're referring to. We believe that there is a message, a last day's message, and we'll look at it in a second. And part of that message is our duty to take care of ourselves, to watch what we eat, watch what we drink, be the arbiters of our bodies because the way we treat ourselves physically will reflect on how we can discern and hear the Holy Ghost. That's the health message. Now accuse me not. Do not accuse me of confusing the message of health with that of salvation. Accuse me not of saying that there is a way that you can eat broccoli and get to the kingdom. Man, some of the things the Lord done brought us out of, ain't that much broccoli in the universe. No, 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 it is clear that we are saved by grace. Accuse me not, but rather accuse me of saying that in these confusing times, in this age that John calls Babylon, we must watch what we eat, what we drink, how we do, because it affects our ability to discern. We need to return the message to the health. And don't freak out. I'm preaching part of my sermon. I won't have an hour long sermon after we pray. It's okay. We need to return the message to the health. But I have found that we have made this separation. We're just preaching the health, the health, the health at people, and we're neglecting the message. In the 1500s, during the Renaissance period, a genius by the name of Michelangelo rose to prominence, 
Michelangelo was a bad boy. When he was 74 years old, while many of us are trying to remember where we put the keys, Michelangelo invented a form of architecture known as mannerism, made it up. Before he was 30 years old, Michelangelo had sculpted the David. You know the David? which to this day is considered one of the greatest examples of a depiction of the human form. Before he was 30, he also created something known as the Pieta, and this is the sculpture of Mary. Maybe you've seen it. And Mary is holding the body of Jesus right after he died. And he just captured the emotion that, that a mother would feel after seeing her son murdered. Michelangelo was a fine sculptor, and he thought that sculpting was the highest form of art. However, one day, the church asked Michelangelo to do something that he does not like to do. They had this chapel known as Sistine, the Sistine Chapel, and the ceiling was blank like this. And they said, Michelangelo, I want you to paint some pictures from the Bible on the ceiling of this chapel. And Michelangelo said, no, I don't paint. That's not my thing. I'm a sculptor. See the David and the Piet? See, that, that was me. That Michelangelo, tell your friends. But he said, no, I want you to paint. Here is a situation where God has called a man to do a thing that he did not want to do. And Michelangelo had to pay the bills. Pastor, that's the church was paying in them days. Remember? <laughs> And so he took this job on, and day after day, and hour after hour, Michelangelo was in that church with his ah, ah, painting on the ceiling. On and on and on. And, and the message was, the message was to create something so beautiful that it brought people closer to God. That was the message. But Michelangelo had such a negative experience. Oh, he hated it. And indeed, because of the hours of craning his neck, trying to paint on the ceiling, he got spurs on his cervical vertebra. And the spurs pinched the nerves. And I don't know if anybody here has ever had a pinched nerve, but that hurts. And the pain radiated down his arms and to his hands, and he could hardly hold the brush. And then his hips developed what's called dysplasia from all this. And his back, he was in agony working for God, terrible experience. But God can use us anyhow. And he did complete that work and people, millions of people come in all the time and they see this work of art. But if you look closely, in the middle of the painting there is God and he's reaching out like this. Anybody seen that? And there's Adam and Adam is reaching back. And if you look close, they don't touch. Oh, have mercy. They don't touch. Here the man is supposed to be doing something that brings God and, and humanity closer together, but he had such a bad experience that instead he put a space between God and the people. Oh, sometimes, church, when we separate the message from the health, the thing that's supposed to bring us closer to God, instead we've beaten people with the health and we put a space. What a tragedy it would be, us working as hard as we can, and instead of bringing people in union with the Father, we are separating them by a space about the width of a veggie burger. It is time to return the message to the health. And life is short. I'm not going to make you wait. Let us have a look right now, shall we? First, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. We will look at chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And we will look at verse 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. I'll wait just a little longer. Okay, let's read this together. And it reads, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do what, everybody? 
whatsoever you eat, whatever you drink, however you comb your hair, however you drive to work every day, do it all to the glory of God. Can we agree on that? Okay, good. Let's look at another text, shall we? Let's go back to Revelation, and this time we want to look at chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6. And again, for the visitors, we're back at this, at this place where the prophet John is being shown the times of the end, and God has an extremely important message for the people in end times, a message so important we gave it a name. We call it the three angels message. Remember that? Let us read together. Verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Here we go. Read this. Saying with a loud voice, do what? Fear God, Fear God and do what? Give glory to him. Why? We can stop right there. Whatsoever ye eat, drink, whatever, do all to the glory of God. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. Glory to God. Glory to God. It appears that the health message is part of the three angels' message. Somebody here don't like that. So I'm going to go ahead and give my argument. Fear God and give glory to him. Except in your health. Hmm? We need to return the message to the health. May I have my B flat, my brother? Mm, let's sing together. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, pure and holy. Tried and true, tried and true, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living, I'll be a living, a sanctuary, sanctuary, Lord, for you, Lord. Let us pray. Our loving Father, Lord, we ask that you would descend upon this place and bless this message. That you would open our minds and our hearts as we discuss the message of the health. Father, I ask that you would hide Ryan. Nobody wants to see that guy. And that you would speak to us all. And that you would bless us all. And Lord, to that one person that maybe barely made it in this morning and is just dying for an opportunity to rededicate him or herself to you, I ask that you would massage that person's heart so that when we give the call to come back to you, they will come running. We ask these things in thy holy name. Let everybody say amen. amen. Returning the message to the health. When I thought I was going to be a doctor, <laughs> and the Lord was just laughing, I once talked to Dr. Moore. Now, Dr. Moore is the head of, was the head of health in the South Atlantic Conference back on the East Coast. And, and we talked about just how we have gotten so much into the health that we have neglected the message of the health. Now, 
I was in Tennessee, Nissa and I were in Tennessee, and Jalen was just a little teeny weeny thing. I was in med school out there. And the, the, the teaching hospital of the med school is right down the way from the Adventist church. And the church, I think, Sister Brown, you may, you may know this, that's Hillcrest, right? The Hillcrest church was right there. So many of the patients that would come into the hospital would be Seventh-day Adventists. We're talking about separating the message from the health. And many times I would find Adventists who were dying of vegetarianism. How do you do that? So, so you come in, you know, into the room, and a person is there, and they are recuperating from a stroke or a heart attack or some other malady. And now there are many things that happen that we cannot help, but there are a lot of things that happen that we can. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look, and you can tell this person has allowed his or her health to slide. And you know, the, the, the church folk have a way of walking. You know, we kind of go into the room like this right here. Hello, ma'am. And then they would ask, are, are you an Adventist? And I say, oh, well, yes, I am. And I can tell, I can tell by the way you walk. Well, amen. <laughs> and they'd say, man, I have no idea how this happened to me. I mean, I had this stroke and I'm recuperating and no, I've been a vegetarian all my life. I've never had any meat. I don't even know what a cow smells like. <laughs> never had no caffeine. I've done this and this and the other. And they're like, you know, I have been faithful in everything that I do. I don't know why I had this stroke. And they're like, let me tell you something else, doctor. And, you know, and I'm like, ooh, man, this thing smells good. I want to bite it so bad. <laughs> <laughs> that we separated the message from the health until we had distilled it into a series of do's and don'ts. And they did the do's and didn't do the don'ts, but neglected to glorify God. <laughs> Can I tell the truth this morning? We need to reconnect the message with the health. And for those of us, well, let me say this first. That's one extreme. And then we observe the other extreme as a result of this health message disconnect. Back in the 1800s, when surgery began to become a mainstay of medical practice, they learned that we were able to go into the human body and fix things in there and make a person better. There was only one problem. Anesthesia had not been invented yet. We can take out your appendix, sir. Ma'am, we can do that C-section, but the bad news is we can't put you out. We can't numb you up. So this is what would happen. And you know how to read about this. This is crazy stuff. They would hire six or seven extremely muscular men or women, maybe some muscular women up in there, and the patient would come in and the burly people would hold them down. That's right. And they'd be kicking and screaming and all this stuff while the physicians would operate wide awake and this was such a scene that usually it drew these great big crowds of people to see this that's a vivisection and it was such a horrible experience people would report remembering the sounds of their bones cracking you know and the feeling as the doctor sliced into their muscles and it was such a bad experience that many people who had a simple procedure just a simple procedure would commit suicide. I would rather die than go through that. And many times we do that in a church with the health message. Man, the new people come in and we get six or seven burly deacons and sisters and, and hold them down. You can take this health message. You better take it. <laughs> and we drive them out. They're like, I'd rather die. Give me my heart attack. <laughs> I'm going to McDonald's right now. I'm going to get me a double cheeseburger. 
with pickle and onion and, you know, you make it right. <laughs> and a strawberry shake and some large fries, and I'm going to sit right there on the bench and I'm going to eat my cheeseburger and don't none of y'all crazy admins come near me. <laughs> hmm? Separation of the message from the health. And you know, for those of us who are trying so hard to make the health message, to make the health palatable, you might want to sprinkle a little message on there. Because the message, as we shall see, is sweet. Oh, yeah. Let's see what the Bible has to say about it, shall we? Run on time here. I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Daniel. And those that know me are thinking, of course, <laughs> we're going to the book of Daniel and we're going to look at the very first verse and the very first chapter. And I'll start reading this first part while we find it. Daniel chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, who was that? King of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, who was that? King of Babylon. And he came unto Jerusalem and besieged it. Now, the book of Daniel opens up on a very bad day. The book of Daniel opens up talking about when God's people, the church people, were invaded by the world, Babylon, and they came in to Judah and kidnapped God's people. Oh, let's read some. Verse 2, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his, Nebuchadnezzar's, hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he, Nebuchadnezzar, carried into the land of Shinar, unto the house of his God. The Babylonian king, this, this non-God-fearing king, came into the house of God's people and defiled the church. Now, why in the world would the Lord let that happen? We'll find out later on. It is because the children of Israel had lost sight of the message. But now here we come to the interesting part. Verse 3, And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes. So the Bible's telling us, so Nebuchadnezzar said, now take the best and the brightest from God's people, and we're going to kidnap them. Can you imagine being in your kitchen one day and the door just burst open and in come foreign people? They kidnap your kids and take them away, never to be seen again? This is what happened. And among the people who were kidnapped, was Daniel. Now, we got Daniel, a church member, and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, or the Hebrew names, and all of these other young church members being taken out of the Pathfinders and Sabbath School and, 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 and ALCA and all these things they were sheltered from, you know, inside of, and being taken into the world, which is Babylon. Now let us read this together. Verse 5. And the king, are you with me? All right. And the king appointed them a daily provision of what? Of the king's meat. And of what? Of the wine which he drank. Keep going. So nourishing them three years. Why? So that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Okay, so the church members have been kidnapped from Judah, and they've been taken into this worldly place where they're doing all kind of stuff, clubbing and doing stuff in the world and all that. And, 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 and the king of the worldly place, Nebuchadnezzar, hmm, says, now, feed them what I eat. Now, when I first encountered this, I just thought that it was the king showing favor to some outstanding young people that he intended to use in his court. But if you look more closely, it says, so that at the end thereof, 
they might stand before the king. Talking about King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, if you study Babylonian culture, you will see you couldn't just stand before the king. You had to look a certain way. You had to dress a certain way. You had to be Babylonian. The purpose was to, oh man, the purpose was to get the church members accustomed to Babylonian culture. I need to turn these church folk into some worldly folk. And I find it interesting, nay, I find it fascinating that the first thing he does to turn God's people into his people is feed them. A very powerful way to be acclimatized to another culture is to eat what they eat. When you go somewhere, right, out of the country or somewhere, they say, come have dinner with us. It is a powerful thing. And the king was assaulting them with unclean foods and unclean meats and all this stuff. I'm making the argument that even today as God's people are in spiritual Babylon, the entire argument about what we should or should not eat is really about how much like them do you want to be? Who's them? Them is everybody that's not Adventist? No. I'll never say such a thing. Them is anybody who is not trying to get it right with God. Whatever you look like, however you walk, whatever kind of car you drive. And so Daniel and his friends do a fascinating thing, don't they? It says in verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, meaning I'm not going to become one of them. Hmm? Nor, as anybody's trying to split hairs, with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he, Daniel, requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. All right? Let's look at verse 12. And let's read together. What, what does he request? Prove thy servants. Read with me. Let's start over. Prove thy servants. I beseech thee. How long? And let them give us what? Pulse to eat and what to drink? So Daniel says, no, no, no. Please give us just pulse and water. Now, what's pulse? Pulse is like, what is it? It is a vegetable, a leafy vegetable. Daniel says, give us pulse and give us water. Now, this is what is really something. The Jews ate meat, didn't they? Jews ate fish, hmm? lamb, quail. Hmm? They ate clean meats. And yeah, they had a way in which they prepared it. What do we call that? But Daniel did not go unto the prince of the eunuchs and say, okay, prince of the eunuchs, here's the meat that we can eat. Please get ye this, 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 divide the hoof and the scales and all that right there and prepare it like this. No. For some reason, all Daniel requested was water and vegetables. What's that about? It would appear that when God's people go into Babylon, there's this way that we start treating ourselves in order to avoid the confusion that is Babylonian culture. See, Daniel could have gotten into this argument, okay, look, but does it divide? Look, well, let me see that meat right, okay, I can eat that. Where does it say I can't eat? No, I'm gonna be safe. I'm gonna do the most I can. Because that's how you do. Daniel only asked for water, and he only asked for vegetables. And I find that to be extremely interesting. Let's look at the result. Let's see, where are we now? Boy, I'm missing that PowerPoint. 
Okay. So they gave Daniel the pulse and the water that he requested. And let's look at what happened. Let's read, let's read, oh, let's see, 18, same chapter. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king communed with them. And among all, among them all, was found none like Daniel. And Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, therefore stood they before the king. And check this out. And in all matters of what, everybody? Wisdom. Wisdom. And what, everybody? Wisdom. Understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them how much more? Ten times more, ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in the realm. Now, what we tend to focus on a lot when it comes to the health message is the benefit. And there is a benefit. You ain't got to be a Christian to know that. They're touting it all over the place. That when you live healthier, when you avoid meats, it's the truth. When you do certain things, there is a physical benefit. You will look better. You will sit taller. You'll be prettier. That is nice. However, look at what the other benefit is. In all matters of wisdom and understanding. Well, what's wisdom? So I looked at the original translation of the word wisdom here. And it literally means a skill that was given from someone else. The word that they use here. Now, the word of God is clear. If any man lack wisdom, let him do what? Let him ask of me. So the wisdom comes from God. Somehow, the way they ate made them more susceptible to the wisdom that God was trying to give everybody. What about understanding? Well, I looked that one up. I think that word is tonaba, an interesting word. And it literally means the ability to separate or to distinguish or to discern. The word of God is saying that the way we eat directly affects the way we can discern and distinguish. And that's important, especially young folk in these, in these times when all this crazy stuff is happening, stuff that's never happened before. Should I drink this? Should I wear this? Can I listen to this? But when we have discernment, we can tell. You need to stay away from that right there because thus saith the Lord. And apparently, according to the Bible, and many of us don't like it, but the Bible is clear that what we eat affects our brains. Somewhere between the table and the toilet, our brains get affected. We like to think we can just eat it and forget it. No, no, no. And cumulatively, this is the word speaking, it affects how we can hear the voice of God. I got two more texts. This time, we're still in Daniel. Let's turn to Daniel, the 10th chapter. And now we're in the end of Daniel. Daniel has been in Babylon for a while. And he's an old man. Daniel is old. And he's been faithful to God. And God has chosen this time in Daniel's life to give him a prophetic message. 